might know what mycotoxins are. If not, let me quickly recap. Hi, I'm Dr. Lauren Tessier of Life After Mold, and today I'm going to be chatting about the four mycotoxin symptoms you should not ignore. Before we start, I just want to remind everybody that, of course, this is not medical advice, and nothing that I cover in today's video is meant to act as diagnosis, treatment, or management of any health issue, and it absolutely does not replace the opinion and direction provided by your local medical practitioner. And of course, all of this is strictly for educational purposes only. So with all that being said, let's get into it. So if you watch my other videos, you might know what mycotoxins are. If not, let me quickly recap. So when we talk about mold and mycotoxins, we're talking about two different things. Molds are the living little cell and the mycotoxins are what they produce. A good friend of mine, Jill Krista, she says it, uh, she states it in such a way where mycotoxins are the farts of mold. <laughs> and it's a, it's a really great, it's a really great way to get it out there. You have the living thing and then you have what they produce, right? So mold is a fungus. It's the stuff that grows on walls, clothes, old boxes in the basement, realistically anywhere that there's enough moisture or, um, you know, poor ventilation. In reality, it doesn't have to be standing water or an active leak. It could be the humidity in the air from a bathroom with no fan or no window, right? So then we have mycotoxins on the other hand, and these are the chemicals produced by some molds. And they're small toxic molecules and they can be inhaled, they can be consumed, um, they can even be absorbed through the skin. And when you're exposed to sufficient amounts, big enough amounts accumulated over time, these toxins start to cause uh, what we call oxidative damage or damage to all the fats throughout your body. And you have fats in every organ, but you also have fats in every single cell. And so these mycotoxins really go throughout the body and cause a lot of damage in every cell. And the problem here is that when it starts to hit every spot in the body, you start to get symptoms in every spot in the body. And that's where the confusion comes from. These symptoms can be easily ignored by patients and their doctor. And as time passes, we find that more and more symptoms occur. So more different symptoms, more new symptoms. And then they also start to like worsen in severity. They get worse. So new symptoms, more and more, and worsening in uh, severity definitely happens. And so when we see this, it can leave the patient frustrated and confused. And of course, it can also leave the provider frustrated and confused. The patient is sick and tired about not being helped and even worse, not being believed. And the provider is frustrated because they didn't learn this stuff in school. And unfortunately for many doctors, maybe they don't have time, unfortunately, or that means that they don't know what to do or even how to seek out their information. So what happens is they chalk up these issues to depression and anxiety, and they end up putting the patient on an antidepressant because they couldn't possibly have that many symptoms. And I hear so many of you <laughs> nodding and <laughs> agreeing in unison. Yep, we, you've seen the antidepressant thing for sure. And so um, maybe they give them an antidepressant, hoping that it it will be it will help shift the case. You know, well intended but unfortunate. Um, or maybe the provider just chooses to disbelieve the patient because it's impossible to have that many symptoms. You know, and this really results in medical gaslighting. But there are some wonderful doctors out there who see the gap in their knowledge, who see the void in their knowledge, and then they go and they seek out answers. They seek out answers on their own time on their own finances just to help the patient that they're really dedicated to. And for them, I applaud you. And maybe it's some of you watching this video today. And if that's the case, I was there too. And I'm so happy that you're here right now. So now that you know about mold and mycotoxins and how symptoms develop and why they go unaddressed, I want to tell you about the four main mycotoxin symptoms that you shouldn't ignore. Now, as a heads up, I do lump some of these symptoms together because they tend to run together. So the first set, I will say, of mycotoxin symptoms that you really shouldn't ignore is brain fog and fatigue. Now, brain fog, it might be the inability to think straight, to learn new things, to follow conversations, remembering simple tasks, um, remembering ordering of things, uh, short-term memory, you know, recalling things that um, you've read. It 
Fatigue, on the other hand, could potentially be the mental fatigue related to brain fog, but it could also be body fatigue, like you're you're physically moving through cement, um, or you're so tired and sleepy that you might pass out. These brain fog and fatigue symptoms can look really different from person to person. And so that's why I kind of lump them together because they often are correlated with one another. The second set of symptoms that you shouldn't ignore is dizziness. Now, to, to get a little bit more clear here, uh, it could be dizziness that happens, like the room is spinning. It can almost be that kind of lightheadedness um, that you almost feel like you're, you have low blood sugar, but you eat and it doesn't change it. That's a very familiar one for um, my clients. We also see... Um, lightheadedness and dizziness when moving from seated to standing. And usually this also comes with um, a spike in heart rate or the feeling that you might pass out. Uh, those definitely all run together and it can be a, a, a neurological thing. It could be a fluid balancing, but that dizziness and lightheadedness, please don't ignore those. Those definitely are things that you want to address and you want to have worked up. The third set of symptoms in our symptoms that you shouldn't ignore is the concept of wandering pain. Now, pain can look very different. It could be muscle pain, it could be deep bone pain, it could be joint pain, it could be nerve pain. All of these are seen with mold exposure and it can very much wander from place to place. You could have deep bone pain one day and the next day you could have some nervy pain and the next day you could have some like skin sensitivity pain or shoulder joint pain the, the day after. Um, the wandering pain in the body's relationship to pain can definitely be a symptom of mold exposure. We know that mycotoxins are very impactful to the nervous system. We also know that mycotoxins are very impactful to the mitochondria or the powerhouses of the cell that are um, very high in number in our muscle cells. So wandering pain can absolutely occur with mold exposure. The fourth grouping of symptoms that I don't want you to ignore is sleeping issues, sleeping difficulties. And this could be issues with falling asleep, staying asleep, not waking well rested, night sweats, night terrors, racing heart in the middle of the night. All of these can definitely come from mold exposure, but they can also come from other things. And that's really what I want to drive home right now for all four of these groupings of mycotoxin symptoms. You know, all of these realistically need to be worked up as they could be Again, the sign of extensive mold exposure, or they could be a red flag for other diseases that realistically should and need to be rolled out ASAP. And in doing so, all the big concerning chronic illnesses are ruled out. And you know, you might need to push hard for a referral so that you can get the all clear, but don't be dismayed when you do get the all clear or you know, you look normal on paper. What it means is that you know what it's not. And that is huge for, for um, undergoing mold illness treatment. In fact, I'm always so thankful when a patient has gone to quite a few referrals to get all the big stuff worked up to be told that they have a clean bill of health because then I know that the work that I'm doing isn't missing anything. We've crossed our T's and we've dotted our I's. So while it can be incredibly frustrating that you haven't gotten answers, it's also wonderful to know that it's not some of the bigger issues. And it's great to know that we're not going to end up treating the wrong thing, you know? And so, yeah, it might mean that you go to a few different specialists and it might mean that you have to push for referrals and prior authorizations with your primary care. And with that being said, don't expect your primary care to know about mold illness. Don't expect your neurologist to know about mold illness. Allow them to do the good work that they know how to do, which is give the referrals and do the workup for the MS and do the nerve conduction studies and all these things. Let them do that so then that way when you finally go to work with your mold illness practitioner, they can do their good work. So it's the same way where, what do they say, you can't expect like your your relationship and your partner to provide everything that you'd ever need to you. That's why you need friends and you need other social supports. It's the same thing with physicians. You need a physician to carry out their specialty. You know, you don't want a uh, to see a kidney doctor 
when you have a skin mole that needs to be removed, you know? So I say embrace it. It's ultimately a good thing. And these referrals, they can be long and drawn out, but again, they tell you what it's not, and that is huge. And then you can feel more confident about pursuing a mold illness workup, again, with a mold illness specialist such as myself. So if you found this information helpful, be sure to like and subscribe and definitely stay tuned for additional videos. And I'm so glad you're here and I'm so excited to help you find your life after mold.